Alright, I want everybody to put their hands together for me. When I give you the cue, you're all going to sing Cabo Verde. Can you handle that? What do you think? Yes? Cabo Verde. Thank you so much. Obrigada, 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 
Obrigada. So my name is Candida Rose Baptista. That's my full name, but simply I am known as Candida Rose musically. And I am second generation American born Cape Verdean. And when I wrote this song called Cabo Verde Un Dia, at the time, which was like 2004, 2005, I had not been to Cabo Verde yet. And that was my prayer. It was a prayer basically saying I was born here and raised here, but I grew up with everything about you in my soul and in my heart and in my blood. And one day I am going to come to you and I am going to see you. And my, my family, my mother, my father are from your islands and I haven't been there yet, but I'm going to come to you one day. And since that song came out in 2006, I've been there like five times. So prayers do come true. <laughs> so this next song, thank you. Uh, so this next song that I'd like to um, lift and um, bring to you is a song called Love Each Other Through. And the song was written uh, the summer of 2020 when we were, now we know, that the beginnings of this pandemic that we're still living through. And we were also um, dealing with the tragedy of George Floyd. And so there was a lot of chaos, a lot of ugliness, lots of things happening um, that were just not very nice. And, it, and I, I, know, I know for one, um, my heart was heavy. However, uh, I work for nursing homes, I sing at nursing homes, and, and I have a daughter who is a CNA, and I saw the beauty of people who would continue to help people no matter what. Um, I saw friends of mine who, um, who, who organized Black Lives Matter events, and the love that was in their heart, even though things were awful, the love that was in their heart helped let me know that there's, there's still humanity, there's still ways that we can get to the other side of this if we hold each other's hand and get each other through. So I'd like to sing this all for all of you. Love each other through. <laughs> treasures we must hold on to no matter what the cost compassion kindness and empathy if we can only name a few and for humanity's sake love's the most Precious in my view. We've got to love each other through till we reach the other side. We must love each other through. Now's not the time.
Thank you so much. Thank you. That's going to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, good evening, folks. My name is Hank Von Hellion. I'm the managing director here at the Worcester Pop-Up, uh, one half of the JMAC. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out today and taking time out of your busy weekday to support us and the candidates and really sort of, um, you know, chat about arts and how important they are to the future of Massachusetts and Worcester and just the world in general. Um, we've got a few uh, uh, really quick sort of uh, admin stuff to get through. So FYI, we're recording this. Um, the plan is to be able to share this recording and this forum with folks that uh, aren't able to make it in person today. Um, so we ask that you please silence your cell phones. However, uh, please feel free to tweet about it at uh, hashtag CT, uh, CTVMA2022. Um, we have a few quick speakers before the forum begins. Um, a little bit about sort of what we do here. Uh, we opened our doors in 2018. We are a sort of creative culture support and catalyst space. We really, really specialize in supporting uh, arts-based organizations, individual artists, um, folks that are trying to do something with some sort of creative bent um, that are either at the beginning or sort of the middle of their uh, middle stages of their art careers or whatever sort of careers they have. Um, and uh, we do our best to support folks um, with this space through our mentorship with, uh, with some amazing funding from folks like the Barr Foundation and Gene McDonough. And so uh, if any of you folks are in the room or know those folks, please thank them for us. We appreciate them. Uh, first off, we're going to start off with Eric Butler, who is the chair of the Worcester Culture Coalition. He's going to say a few words. And uh, welcome, Eric. All right. Thank you, Hank. And Candida Rose, thank you. What a, what a gift. It was such a treat for us to start the, the evening out that way. My name is Eric Butler. I am chair of the board of the Worcester Cultural Coalition. I'm also past president and current board member for WCLOC Theater Company, Worcester's oldest community theater, and most recently founded uh, Broadway in Worcester, a uh, celebrity concert series here in Worcester and, and home at the JMAC. But while my day job is in education technology, my passion for the arts remains paramount. For those of you unfamiliar with the Worcester Cultural Coalition, we are a public-private partnership between the city of Worcester and the 80-plus cultural organizations in the region. Most recently, the Cultural Coalition opened up this space, the Gene McDonough Art Center, including the pop-up and the brick box theater, really to make sure every artist had a home in this region. In fact, if you go to the JMAC website, you'll see the words, our space, your home, 
And if anyone in this room has worked with the incredible team here, Hank, Livy, Domenica, and Sarah, you'll know that that saying rings true. Anyone who walks through this door either as an artist or an audience member definitely feels at home, and we hope you feel that way tonight. On behalf of the Worcester Cultural Coalition, I just want to thank the local creatives here tonight and also the candidates as well. We really appreciate you making this a priority uh, of your time and, and efforts and conversation tonight. One of the works uh, that we really try to focus on with the Worcester Cultural Coalition is certainly around advocacy work. So this type of dialogue engagement is really, really important for our coalition, but also our community. And to those artists in the room, certainly as we make our way out of this pandemic, I just want to thank you because your work over these past couple months have brought us back together, have lifted us up, have provided us some escape, and most importantly, made us in touch with what it is to be a community and, and human again. So thank you so much, and thank you for being here tonight. Up next, we have uh, Olivia Scanlon, who's actually the managing director of the space you're sitting in, the Brick Box Theater. And here she is. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. You look handsome in your suit thingy. <laughs> Folks, hi, I'm Olivia Scanlon. You can call me Liv or Livy. Thank you for the introduction. It is my uh, great pleasure and privilege to be the managing director of this theater. And special thanks to my colleague, Sarah McIntyre, who helps me manage it. Um, who's running for office? Hi, Emily said I would have the chance to address you directly, and I'm, I'm gonna use my time to do that. Um, first of all, may the universe be with you. I ran for city council in Cambridge, and um, I never ever want to do this ever again. So uh, it takes a lot to do what you're doing, and um, have everyone tell you how you should be doing it. So now that I've said that, I'm gonna tell you what I think you should be doing. <laughs> um, it really is not a kumbaya thing to say that the arts are completely vital. Um, think about this state without its institutions. Uh, it's just almost um, scary to think of how barren we would be um, in so many ways. And creative people do so much with so little. And that even if we had just a little bit more help, what we could do is just wild. And I know that you don't necessarily hear from your arts constituents as much as you should. It's partly because we're all working for jobs. You say it. You make it important. You make it part of your platform. Don't need us to do it. We're doing the work. <laughs> we need you to help us. Um, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for my time, <laughs> and um, good luck to all three of you. And up next, uh, you know her and you love her, uh, <laughs> Emily. Thanks, Hank. Good evening, all. I'm Emily Ruddick. I'm the executive director of Mass Creative, but tonight I'm here as a part of the Create the Vote Coalition. Over the coalition this year, it includes over 60 cultural organizations, arts groups, and individual artists, arts organizations, arts administrators and cultural leaders. And together, we're working to make sure that the issues that affect the arts community are top of mind when folks go into um, their polling stations in September for the primaries and then in November for the general. Um, just really quickly, since 2013, the Create the Vote Coalition has worked to connect candidates, voters, and, art, and the arts community together for just this for conversation, to imagine what it would look like if we could encourage and increase the amount of public support and pro-arts and cultural policies in Massachusetts, and what that would mean if every single person in Massachusetts could reap the benefits that come with creative expression and cultural participation. And so I'm really glad to have you all here tonight, both our candidates, our moderator, um, our you all are guests, and I just also wanted to say a very special thank you to the organizers of tonight. That includes the Mass Creative Team, um, our Director of Engagement and Organizing, G.V. Quach, 
our campaign manager, Karen Alzire, and then two of our Create the Vote fellows, Hank Von Hellion, who you've already met, and Kim Jones. Together, they put together this event and are the reason we are all here tonight. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it back to Hank. <laughs> Uh, finally, I swear you're almost done hearing from me. Uh, I want to introduce our moderator for the night. Uh, Il Sorry, I don't want to mess up her name. Uh, Ilana Brownstein, and she's the director of new work at Company One Theater. Yeah. Ilana? Right here. Oh, here. Sorry. Hi, welcome. Um, Indeed, that is my title. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. And I wanted to just mention that Company One Theater is a Boston-based multiracial theater company whose mission is to create community at the intersection of art and social change. And before I invite our candidates up here, I'm so sorry to the stage manager. You're really going to hate me. Could we have the lights up a little bit, if it's possible? They may be pre-programmed. Ah, very good. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> Hello, it's really nice to see you. Um, I hope you'll take a moment and look around this room and see who's here with us. Before we begin, uh, I just would like to take a moment to breathe together. Sometimes we come into spaces like this and we are still bringing with us all the stressors of the day. I imagine that is you know, a hundred times true for our candidates who are traveling the state and showing up at many events. So I'm just gonna ask us to spend a moment, just take a couple deep breaths together because we're just humans in a room. Thanks. I think it helps us to feel a little more connected um, so that we can have a really great conversation with one another. So I'm gonna invite our candidates to come join me up here and I'll give the shortest of introductions to them and then they'll be able to speak about um, their own things for a few minutes and I'll tell you more about the format as we get going. So come on up, friends. So I'm going to introduce folks, I think uh, I'll start um, directly to my side here. This is uh, Dr. Tammy Gouveia, who we're so happy to have you here with us today. Um, Tammy is a state rep for the 14th Middlesex District, which includes parts of Acton, Carlisle, Chelmsford, and Concord. Did I forget any? Perfect. Um, and she is a social worker and policymaker with a special interest in public health. Um, next down the line, we have Eric Lesser, who is a state senator for the 1st Hamden and Hampshire District, which includes a whole lot of towns, I'm going to try and get them all right, uh, Belchertown, Chicopee, East Longmeadow, Granby, Hamden, Longmeadow, Ludlow, Springfield, and Wilbraham. Right on. Uh, Eric is a lawyer who specializes in issues of economic development and as a side hustle, which I know artists appreciate, we all appreciate a side hustle, he served as the script consultant for seven seasons of Veep on HBO. And finally, down at the, end, at the end of the line, we have Kim Driscoll, a longtime mayor of Salem and the first woman to hold that office. She's an attorney by training and calls herself a proud member of the Get Stuff Done wing of government, which I feel like we can all appreciate. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about what the structure of this evening is going to look like, and then I will turn it over to each of you for some opening statements. So uh, those opening statements will be about three minutes each. Um, I'm gonna, I, I have a watch, but I'm not gonna like interrupt you unless we go well over. Uh, this is a moderated conversation on the future and possibilities of Massachusetts art and culture sector with answers of about one to two minutes each um, with some leading questions I'll throw your way and, and some follow-up questions that I hope we'll discover as our conversation gets going. And then at the end, we'll have closing statements of probably about three minutes each. Um, so we'll hold that time at the end. This is not a debate. 
<laughs> I think it's important to say that. Uh, though it was great to hear the three of you last night on GBH. I did enjoy that debate. Uh, that was the race's first formal debate. Um, but you can relax because uh, we're not here to fight about anything, nor, nor did you last night, frankly. Well, very nice. Uh, this room is full of arts and culture workers and stakeholders, and we're really excited to hear about how, in your vision, the lieutenant governor can strengthen this important state sector. Before we uh, really get going, I am mindful of who is represented on this stage and who is not. Our collected racial, gender, ethnic, and economic identities are not fully representative of the rich diversity of Massachusetts or of the arts sector. Many, in addition to those of us on stage, there are folks in the room, but many could not be here tonight due to lack of access, be it economic or transportation, health or dependent care support, or they did not feel welcome for one reason or another. Um, or did not feel that events like this are for them. This is certainly a challenge that is facing Massachusetts across many sectors. And I wanna make sure that we bring an equity lens to our conversation tonight because that is really important, especially in the arts and culture sector. So I would like to turn it over. Um, I think I'll ask you to start, Tammy, and uh, just turn your mic on and uh, I'll give you about three minutes. Let us know, let us know what's going on with you. You can all hear me? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you all for putting this together. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I appreciate the exercise that you started with us uh, just before we got started with grounding us and bringing us into uh, this space as a community. Uh, something that I really appreciate as a social worker and as a mom um, and as an activist. Uh, just a little bit about me. I grew up in the city of Lowell. Uh, Art is the handmade good is the motto for the city of Lowell. Um, so I really grew up uh, with that stuck in my brain. I also was lucky enough in growing up in a musical household. My dad was in a band and uh, I listened to live music because they practiced uh, in my basement all while I was growing up. And I remember the first time I ever went to a bar and went dancing. I was 12 years old to hear him play. So music and art is definitely something that I have appreciated while growing up. Um, as an adult, as a social worker, as a public health expert, I've also done work in spaces with, um, you know, putting human-centered design in principles into action. Um, and the reason why I got into this race is because of the ways that our state has been leaving people behind for decades. Um, the lack of investments in our communities, in our families, making sure that our transportation systems work, that they're accessible, making sure that our housing is affordable and humane, making sure that every person has access to full education that includes STEAM, and I'm hoping we'll get into some questions about that later because I have some ideas. But I got into this race because we are leaving so many folks behind, and our pandemic response was truly, in my mind, as a public health expert, a privatized response that forced people to engage in Hunger Games style to try to get access to a vaccine. And that continued when it went on with trying to get access to rapid antigen tests. So that's what drew me into this race. I've been a single mom for 14 years, so I have also experienced the financial insecurity, the isolation, the shame, the worry that comes with not knowing how you're gonna get by when your bank balance is negative yet again and you have to borrow money just to put food on the table for yourself and your family. So that's why I'm in this race. And as the next Lieutenant Governor, what I'm really focused on is putting the health, the well-being, and the dignity of every single person at the center. So we're really focused on people and being people-centered as we're making decisions, as we address the climate crisis, the housing crisis, the mental health crisis, the childcare crisis, and as we're trying to make our way and ensure an equitable recovery from COVID. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I really look forward to our conversation and I wanna thank my colleagues for being up here uh, with us. And again, nice to see you um, again today. Well, uh, oh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. I can't really see anybody because of the lights, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to make eye contact. Uh, just want to thank you, Alana. I want to thank uh, my fellow candidates, Representative Duvea and Mayor Driscoll. Uh, it's great to be here in Worcester. 
Uh, really appreciate and really admire all the exciting things that have been happening in Worcester in recent years. It's really a great model uh, for our cities around the state uh, of just a, a city on the move with so much happening and so much going on. So I thought what I would do is just uh, introduce myself a little bit, share a little bit about who I am, uh, why I do this work in three minutes, uh, but I do want to specifically tie it uh, to arts and culture, uh, programming and arts and culture in our commonwealth. So I live in Longmeadow, uh, which is a town right next to Springfield, about 60 miles or so west of here. Uh, but I'm not originally from there. I was born in Queens, New York. Uh, my dad grew up in the Sheepshead Bay housing projects of southern Brooklyn. Uh, a lot of the people he grew up with, uh, they had tattoos on their arms uh, from surviving the Holocaust. Uh, my mom, Joan Granucci, uh, she grew up in a third floor walk-up apartment uh, in New York's Little Italy and uh, shared a bed, uh, not a bedroom, but a bed uh, with her grandmother until she was in her mid-20s. Speaking of plays and performances, you know that, uh, that uh, play, uh, My Dad is Jewish and My Mother's Italian and I'm in Therapy? That, <laughs> that was a little bit uh, of, uh, of, of our upbringing. But I share that because we moved to Western Mass uh, when I was seven uh, because that's where the jobs were and that's where the opportunity was and central to our identity in the Pioneer Valley, and I see Russ Piotr here, uh, who's been a leader in the sector for a long, long time, is the arts and culture. It's a central part of who we are. It's a central part of our economic strategy, of our cultural heritage, uh, and of who we are uh, as a community. And arts and culture has been central to my work in the Senate uh, over the last eight years in the State Senate. When I got started, I chaired our Committee on Arts and Culture, uh, which oversees, of course, the Mass Cultural Council. I uh, got to know Anita Walker very well, and of course, Mike Bobbitt uh, after, after Anita, uh, and have worked very closely uh, with many cultural organizations uh, in the greater Springfield area over the last several years. Just a few examples, and I know we'll get into things uh, in more detail. I've spent the last six years working with the Community Music School of Springfield on an adaptive music program that has gotten uh, uh, special education teachers at our Springfield Public Schools trained in music education and has gotten music teachers trained in special education. Uh, it's an incredible program that has allowed students that otherwise might not have access to music or access to you know, really feeling included in school uh, to, uh, to have another uh, venue. I've also worked really closely with the Springfield Cultural Partnership, uh, which has worked on, done intersectional work across various communities uh, and, um, and groups in Springfield to try to use the arts, use culture to help empower uh, communities uh, and also lead to more growth and economic development. Uh, and another program I've been particularly proud of uh, over the last several years is an effort to make sure that we have special education teacher, excuse me, um, uh, arts and culture teachers and music teachers in all of our uh, public schools. We, it's, it's, it's shocking that in a state as wealthy as ours, as prosperous as ours, that has education as such a foundational principle as ours, that so many of our schools, high schools and middle schools, uh, don't have uh, music or arts education uh, as part of their uh, bedrock curriculum. We've worked to expand it to every school uh, in Springfield. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't bring it up, but uh, the Springfield Museums uh, and the Dr. Seuss Museum uh, has been a big uh, part of the work we've done in Springfield. And every resident of Springfield can go to the Springfield Museums, which is a five museum complex, arts, history, science, for free. Uh, and that's something I'd like to see at all of our museums uh, in Massachusetts, an important goal I think we should have for all of our local museums in all of our cities and towns. So thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. I'm Kim Driscoll, I'm the mayor of Salem, and I'm so thrilled to be here, not only to be in Worcester, which really just feels like the champagne cork is off this city, which is so much happening, but frankly to be in this particular space, wonderful performance, a chance to be with colleagues, and to really talk about something that's not only near and dear to my heart, but so key to what makes our community and so many communities across Massachusetts special. The arts, the artists, the cultural assets, the organizations, key to our identity in my community for sure, key to our quality of life, our economy. It's embedded in so much of Salem. I thought I would share just a little bit uh, about who I am, why I'm enthusiastic about this race, and some of the work we've done and try and get it in in under three minutes if I can. So I'm not a native of Salem, I'm actually a Navy brat. I was born in Hawaii, lived on both coasts. My dad grew up in Lynn, and my mom is from Trinidad. We moved around a lot. 
And I came to Salem to go to college. And frankly, I never left. I fell in love with the community. I fell in love with my husband, Nick. And together, we raised our three children there. I was not always the mayor of Salem, although I have been mayor for the last 16 years. My first experience in local government was working for the city of Chelsea as they came out of receivership, a city that was really down on its knees. I was hired as part of a team uh, to be their in-house legal counsel and then became their deputy city manager. And that experience really taught me the value of like good government and what it means to be on the ground helping people every day. And frankly, who pays the price when there are failures in leadership? And to no one's surprise, it's usually the most vulnerable among us. But while I was working in Chelsea, I was always living in Salem and feeling like this amazing community you know, took two steps forward and one step back. And some of the, the lessons that I learned in Chelsea and, and frankly, the level of professionalism that was, I was experiencing working in municipal government wasn't in place in my own hometown. So in 2005, I quit my job and decided to run for mayor in Salem. I wasn't from the community. Um, I, uh, Salem had never elected anybody who uh, was not born and bred in Salem, and certainly uh, not anybody who was not a male. So it was a bit of a hurdle there. Um, but I worked hard and really felt a connection to improving city operations, to making sure that no matter where you live, you're gonna have benefit coming from your local government. And if you think about what local government does, it's, it's frankly the branch of government we all rely on the most, educating our kids, keeping our neighborhoods safe, investing in those places you make memories, places like this, city squares, downtown parks. Um, 16 years after being elected, Salem is really a hip, historic, vibrant destination. We've made historic investments in parks and schools in buildings. Um, and I'm really proud of the work we've done, particularly around the creative economy. And that was a lesson for Salem. As much as we had this amazing history, we're an old city and people were used to, you go to job with a lunch bucket, you have a shift and you work. And we started to talk about the creative economy and what that meant. And those of you here know, it's an industry, but it's very much, uh, as Liv said, three or four jobs, it's a side hustle. And we really wanted to make sure we understood the value of that creative economy of arts and culture in our community. So we created a public art master plan that mapped out those assets, brought people together. I was fortunate to hire the first public, full-time public art planner in our community. That's led to sustainable investments for uh, you know, murals and, uh, and sculptures and monuments. We revitalized a historic block known as Artist Row. Uh, that's where we have incubator space for artisans and arts. And that's where our artist in residence program is. It's really given us a chance to lean in. The, the amount of resources that we've been able to take away from that one incubator space and that artist in residence program is amazing. We've also worked to make sure we've got sustainable models to invest in art, in placemaking, in festivals, the sorts of things that bring people together and really talk about it as an industry. The thing about the arts sometimes is we don't think of it as important as life sciences or STEM or industries that Massachusetts is known for, yet this is fundamental to the fabric of the places we live and the quality of life that we all enjoy. I'm proud of the work that we're doing now to embed art in so much more of what we do in public projects from new pools and roadway projects and vertical construction as well, both private and public sector. That started with bringing people together to understand the value of art in our community. So thrilled to be here, thrilled to talk about this and engage in this conversation and find ways to make sure that what we're doing on the ground in communities and how that connects to the state um, is critical. As Lieutenant Governor, I really want to lean into this work. I think we should have a cabinet secretary focus on art and culture, that we really have a sustainable revenue stream. It feels like we're always begging for crumbs of resources, and I think there's an opportunity for us to do more there in that space. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, so you both sort of preempted one of my first questions, but I want to make sure that, um, that you have a chance also to share. My question was going to be about, in your currently held office, how do you prioritize arts and culture? And I think we got a pretty great picture from our opening statements, but I'd I want to make sure you have a chance as well. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, so, you know, when COVID hit, we heard uh, quite extensively, really loudly and clearly um, about the needs of the arts and culture sector um, when COVID hit and just the impact on livelihoods. As a doctor of public health, I was one of the early folks calling for, unfortunately, restrictions on in-person gatherings, which I know had tremendous impacts. But I also called for getting cash benefits out to folks immediately. It wasn't something that we were willing to take up in the legislature, 
but I think there's always an opportunity to do a both and, do what's in the best interest of public health and safety, while also making sure that we aren't leaving anybody uh, you know, straggling or suffering or stressed out and worried about how you're gonna get your basic needs met. I really carried that perspective through the whole COVID pandemic. It's actually really how I've always lived my life as a social worker, as an activist, as someone who grew up uh, in a gateway city, just making sure that we are calling on government, that we are expecting our state and local governments to make sure that we are all invested in. Um, I firmly believe that the successes that I have are really wrapped up in people I've never even met, my neighbors from across the state, and the successes of their, their children. So it's not a specific mindset towards the arts and cultural space, but making sure that so many of the folks uh, like you here in this room who are probably gig workers or you're working as consultants and supporting artists, that they are really front and center and, and also included. And I think that's the kind of thing that we need to continue to uh, have an eye towards um, as we address housing, as we address the big issues that are already here. Um, so I think that's, I'll leave it at, well, I'll say one other thing because that is my current job, is focused on um, advocating for policies that really speak to the needs of our residents. But throughout my career, um, prior to getting elected as a state representative, I did some work, as I mentioned, uh, focused on human-centered design and rapid cycle prototyping and you know, some work with IDEO and thinking about how do we engage artists at the table um, as problem solvers, as folks who help us get to the root causes of the problems, um, because you're already uh, sort of, you show up on the planet thinking about people first, uh, and that's part of the training, and so really bringing you in. I agree with Mayor Driscoll having some sort of cabinet level position where there are artists and residents to help us get at the root drivers of those issues, not just in beautifying and bringing community spaces together, but also in addressing the big issues of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all three of you have touched on something that um, is really important for me personally, but I think across our sector. So, you know, we can talk about the arts in a couple of different ways. We can talk about intrinsic impact. So uh, what the arts do for us as humans as we try to understand our lives, each other, our communities, and the great existential questions, right? We can also talk about, as we have um, in this conversation already, we can talk about economic impact. Um, how the arts drives uh, economic benefits for associated businesses, for neighborhoods, for areas of cities, uh, for transit, for things like that, as well as the impact of the workforce itself, right? And the folks who actually are arts workers, because arts work is work. Uh, so we can talk about it in those two ways, and I think that oftentimes, especially in, I think, state-level conversations, it's separated into uh, conversations about intrinsic impact and conversations about economic impact. But I'm interested whether we could maybe have a conversation here about um, an amalgamation of those two positions. So where, because of the emotional value and the ways that participating in art making or witnessing the work of artists, um, how it impacts us personally, that it can be an integral component of building stronger cross-sector initiatives with regards to housing, public health, transit, education. You are asking uh, the voters to support you in an executive level position, the lieutenant governorship, which actually has some flexibility in the fact that it has almost <laughs> no definition in terms of the things you are required to do. There's just a few things. And so many lieutenant governors work with the governor they serve to define a set of uh, initiatives or priorities. I would like to hear from you, each of you, um, how you might envision the arts sector as part of this amalgamation of where the arts meets other things, <laughs> other sectors in our state that are really uh, important for the health of our communities. Um, and I, whoever would like to start. I'll, I'll take a shot at going first, and I think there's probably um, 
lots to think about in that particular question. So hopefully we can have a lively, lively discussion. You know, when I think about what we do in government, there is this sort of return on investment component. We're not spending our money, we're spending taxpayer dollars. So we tend to always look at the economic benefits, but the intrinsic value here is so real and I think understood by many individuals. But how do we think about that work and embedding it in what we do? And where I go to, especially, you know, as you know, government is slow to change, right? As, as we all know is embedding uh, the work of artists and thinking about how we embed that work in all that we do. Like, imagine for a minute if the folks who worked at the MBTA, if we had artists embedded in how we thought about the wayfinding signage. I'm not talking about running the trains or preventing them from catching on fire, which has been a problem lately, but I'm talking about the everyday experience that people have. So much of it you rely on through some level of government. Imagine if we had a civic core of artists helping us, like New York City does, right? And how we think about communicating with residents. So much of what government struggles with is that level of engagement. Whether it's uh, a new program rolling out for how you're gonna pick up trash, key things, or the way that you engage space and people entering space. It really turns the table. We have engineers doing that, you have bureaucrats doing that. How do you embed people with different skills around the table to think about this particular value. Well, the way you do that is through budgeting. So I hate to say, get back to the economic value. It's really showcasing the difference that can happen when you have artists in these spaces. So I think we need to have a commitment to invest first, right? To, to recognize that this is going to be valuable to an organization. We recently redid a whole entire recreational and conservation area, including a new pool. As part of that concept, we had an art competition for the splash pout outside. Like amazing work was created by artists, uh, both some local and some from further away, that was embedded into a public works project that was a 100 year old pool that will hopefully be there for at least another 50 years. Never would have thought of how they engaged the splash pad and the pool and the signage and how it all worked together unless we had took that leap. So those of us in government need to be prepared to say, no, it's important to have an artist core embedded in the very uh, basic functions of governing and expect that you're not only going to get an economic value out of that, but you're going to get an intrinsic value out of that. And that would be my at least first recommendation as we think about this. And I could go on on education, but I will leave that. And youth, so much of our youth coming out of this pandemic are really struggling right now, how we think about art therapy and embedding that in the schools. As mayor, I also chair the Salem School Committee. Salem is a gateway city, very diverse. We teach in over 49 languages. Like, there's a lot happening right now with young adults, and I think art is a really important component for us to ingrain in how we think about that, um, the, the interruptions and disruptions of the, our educational system as we move forward. <clears throat> uh, thanks for the qu question, Alana. And there, there really is a lot of alignment and agreement uh, uh, among the three of us. Uh, but it's a really key question and something I, I struggle with, frankly, in terms of articulating the value of arts, because I think that there is a tendency to immediately go to the dollars and cents argument. Uh, but just to acknowledge that for a second, I do think that that is important uh, to remind our broader political community about, because there is a misconception in Massachusetts, you hear a lot about the eds and the meds, the life sciences, the tech sector, the, the, the schools, the hospitals, as drivers of the economy. But the reality of it is, is that the arts and culture and tourism sectors are, are, are our third largest sector uh, by employment. So it is a very important economic engine for the state, and we shouldn't be shy about saying that. Uh, and you all pay taxes just like every other industry and every other sector, uh, and you're generating uh, visits, you're generating parking in downtown, you're generating uh, you know, restaurant stops and everything else. Uh, so we do have to lean into that as much as we can and remind people of it. Uh, but just a couple of, uh, of examples of just the intrinsic value and what makes arts and culture so unique as a intersectional solution to a lot of different issues. Uh, I've been involved, and we, we haven't gotten it done yet, but as Lieutenant Governor, we're going to work to sign uh, legislation creating a percent for arts program. This, I know many of you have uh, worked on this. This has been a priority of Mass Cultural Council for a long time. Think about if a percent of every public building, public construction project included a component of public-facing art. You know, we used to do that in this country. You think about the incredible WPA projects, the murals, that you see in, uh, in, in some of those uh, buildings from that era. 
Uh, think about uh, what it can do to our public spaces. Think about how a courthouse could become so much more welcoming, so much more of a comfortable space for people if you invite artists in to help design it uh, and to help uh, design the, uh, the, both the entrances and the, and the interior. Uh, just a couple of other um, you know, examples. Art in mental health, and art and music and culture, and I say art broadly, art meaning all, all, all artistic uh, work, uh, as a way to help solve a, a very severe crisis we face right now around mental health. I know Mass Cultural Council was involved, and Mass Creative was involved in an effort we had in the legislature uh, to set up a, uh, like a prescription program for arts and culture. So the idea is, is that the way a doctor or a, or a mental health professional might prescribe medicine will prescribe attendance at a cultural organization or participation in an, in an arts community event and pay for the ticket because oftentimes these, these, um, these activities are not accessible to people. That was a pilot program that was done at the Mass Culture Council. I'd like to see that expanded uh, because I think it could be a great way to help people deal with the stress that we're facing in our society right now Go to a performance, go to a museum, spend time uh, engaging in, um, in, uh, in that part of your brain and that part of your soul, and it will help uh, a lot. You know, I, I could go on, but another important way we can integrate arts uh, into, into more sectors and the way it's sort of inherently valuable in and of itself, let alone the dollars and cents, is in education. I feel very strongly about this because I've seen this in my communities. You can teach math through art, through music. You can teach English through spoken word, through hip hop, through all, ki times, all kinds of expression. Oftentimes we forget that, uh, that the arts can be a bridge and an opening for so many other sectors, so many other disciplines that people might not otherwise get access to or feel comfortable uh, engaging with. So we need to build that uh, into, into curriculums more. Um, and we need to just be comfortable with acknowledging that we can give grants, we can support uh, art programs, theater programs that might not return a dollar for dollar investment, but it's important because it's just inherently important. The same way, you know, a road or a train or a, uh, you know, or an airport might not initially pay for itself. It's an investment in the future uh, that you put in for, for future generations. So it's a really important question and a, and a really important topic. And as Lieutenant Governor, I think a role you can play is helping lift that work that's already happening in a lot of different communities around the state and try to replicate it and scale it to more places uh, and to more areas around the Commonwealth. So the way I'm thinking about this and the way I heard the question was, when I hear the word intrinsic, what I automatically kind of go to is the individual. And that is all well and good, art is, left to individual interpretation. But I think one of the challenges that we've had is when we see things as something that belongs to the individual, we don't invest in it as a collective. We don't invest in it collectively. And therefore, we've underinvested in arts education. We've underinvested in our artist community. We've underinvested in performing arts centers. I was talking with someone just before we came in here and I asked about, well, what are your revenue sources? Tickets and grants, you know, and part of those grants are, many of them are not state grants, they're not state dollars. And putting you all in a position where you're fighting for the same pieces of the small pie doesn't get us to the place where art is really, and culture is really a collective and that's valued collectively. And the reason why this for me is pretty personal and important, and it, it goes to a little bit of what Senator Lesser said around education, is that I believe that the arts saved my child. Because we were growing up in the city of Lowell when I became a single mom, I moved to Acton. And all of a sudden, they had access to greater arts program. Art was done every single day in their classroom for the entire time that they were in the class. That's not happening in every single community across the Commonwealth. Why? Because we see it as an individual choice based on this school district or if you have enough money to make the investment in it. And oh, by the way, if you're in a school district under receivership, arts and music goes away. You don't even have access to that at all. And these are the students who probably need it the most because it taps into who they are as people bringing forth 
who they are as people, as makers, as problem solvers, as someone engaged. But when I think about my child, um, his name is Cam, he, they pronouns, I know that art saved their life. They are photographer. They are crocheting. He crocheted like mad through the pandemic. And if they didn't have that as an outlet, I don't know what would have happened. And this goes to exactly the thing that I also think about where we've underinvested. Childcare, mental health, human services. Anything that is seen as optional or a nice to have or a luxury or something that is just inconvenient for us to invest in, we don't make the investments. And heck, we can even argue that the things that are vital, like our infrastructure, we haven't even been making those investments. So the way I think about supporting the collective well-being is to have a fairer tax structure, fair share amendment, changing the way that we do corporate taxes in our state, changing the way that we think about whose responsibility it is to pay for these things. Because I don't think that folks in this room and folks outside across the Commonwealth who are involved in arts and culture and music should be begging for grants from the state, it should be something that is automatically set aside as a must-have investment. And I also think about it as it relates to the climate crisis, because there's a lot of phenomenal design work that also goes into creating beautiful spaces where people want to gather, where people want to be in community, rather than sitting in their own house by themselves, isolated. So I see all of these issues as very uh, interconnected, how we tax folks, how we think about investments, how we think about infrastructure, how we think about community design, and does it support accessibility? So I really appreciated the way you, open it, you opened, acknowledging the fact that we are all white folks up here, um, pretty well educated, pretty you know, middle upper class, have had a lot of um, privileges and, and for great fortune in our lives, and who is left out of solving these problems? You know, I don't know if there are folks with disabilities in this room, but we are not designing communities and housing to support our aging population, disabled people, and then we also have to think about long COVID and what that also means for possibly creating even more people with disabilities than we've ever even anticipated. So I, that, when you said the word intrinsic, I just heard individual and our rugged individualism and you gotta figure it out on your own. We are a commonwealth, we need to start acting like it. Thank you. Um, I, I hope you'll allow me to take a moment. I would like to tell the three of you about two issues that are plaguing our sector. And then I would like to ask you, as I'm talking, to think about what, in your position as lieutenant governor, what would a specific strategic intervention look like? Um, very, I, I, so this is one where I'm, I'm really looking for specifics. It doesn't have to be, and again, there's no right answers to these, right? But I wanna give you these sort of two issues that are certainly top of mind for me these days. So the first one has to do with money for, um, for marginalized art makers and organizations. So because of the makeup and structure of the sector, there are small and mid-sized organizations across the state uh, in urban centers, in rural areas, in gateway cities that serve audiences of color and audiences and participants of marginalized identities. But those organizations can't access the levels of public investment that the larger organizations, which are primarily white institutions, that they have access to. So this is a major equity issue, and I know it's not unique to the arts. I know just yesterday the three of you were talking about how this same problem manifests in government contracting. And yet, the arts is also, as you have all mentioned, wildly underfunded statewide at the executive level. Um, the second issue I want to talk about, and these are really pulling threads that the three of you have touched on. Um, in Massachusetts, biotech is absolutely a growth sector, right? It receives massive incentives, funding, um, and perhaps most importantly, workforce development initiatives and training that begins in the high schools. It cultivates workers for biotech, and it means that innovations that happen here are supported by people who live here. 
the art sector does not receive this sort of executive level investment, especially in workforce development and training programs. And so young people leave the field or they leave the state due to the lack of opportunity, even though we have a wealth of higher education arts training programs. So when we lose the folks that train here because they can't find work here, or when uh, folks who grow up here in our gateway communities, in our rural and urban centers, when they don't see the arts as a possibility, we lose entire generations of potential artists who, as we've already discussed, have the potential to create great change in our souls, in our hearts, in the ways we move through the world, right? So I would love to hear if you have any specific strategic interventions that could come from the lieutenant governor's office that might address one or more of these issues. There's a lot I just brought up, but um, I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. I'm happy to start. Um, we actually have worked on a cultural arts platform as, as lieutenant governor that I would hope to work on as I'm, if I'm fortunate to get enough to be elected. And I, because I believe so much in this industry, it doesn't act like an industry all the time, but it is an industry to your point, and how do we treat it that way? And I'll just say personally, one is showing up for, for performances, and two is paying for art. Two things we've insisted in my community. We don't ask people to give us their art, we pay for it. But here's a couple of ideas to pick up on what you said. One is working to establish a fund. Like I can't say enough about resources, the necessity for it to be sustainable. And frankly, the time is now. We have historic resources in the state, both federal ARPA dollars, which are designed post-pandemic to help people that were impacted by the pandemic. I can't think of another community that has been impacted more, frankly, than artists, cultural institutions, and the like. So working to set up an investment fund, you know, I picked the number of 25 million higher, lower, uh, with Commonwealth Arts Development Agency. We have development agencies for housing, we have development agencies for high tech, you talked about the other industries within life sciences. How do we work to set up a structure? Because we need a structure for this. We just can't all like it and love it and feel good about it. We need to put a structure in place within state government which will allow us to raise money, to acquire and hold property, to finance the acquisition and development of cultural assets. Sometimes the most difficult part of funding at any level is those early startup dollars. When it comes to workforce training, you know, why don't we have an executive office of labor and workforce and a program tied to the creative industries and to cultural workers? It's key, it's different than trying to you know, career change into uh, a STEM field. This is something that would be specific within regional workforce investment boards that we have throughout all of Massachusetts. Uh, a youth summer jobs program, picking up on art and culture, so critical to get our young adults who have a passion for this, who have a desire for this, working and working in this field. With respect to thinking about BIPOC-led efforts, we can commit to multi-year funding and working uh, with a cohort of BIPOC-led arts and culture organizations for support, you know, pick a number of organizations. Can we find 30 organizations that are doing great work? I could almost name 20 right now that are doing amazing work that we want to replicate in communities. Let's fund them. Let's not have them sing for their supper. Let's not have it be so difficult where they spend all the time raising money. That's time that could be going into programming. As we think about that, can we have a permanent function in the Mass Office of Business Development that's tailored towards supporting startup capital for creative businesses? Those industries, again, that those startup dollars are really, really typical, or really, really difficult to find. And lastly, a specific fund uh, set up for disabled artists and arts organizations and programs that uh, towards fe that feature disabled artists. Uh, those are not off the top of my head. We really have given this some thought. I want to be clear, this is an area that I'm passionate about, that I've seen the value in my own community, that I really want to lean in. We don't have enough champions, frankly, in the state house for arts and culture that also understand the structure of governing. It's twofold, not just loving it, but also figuring out a way to make sure it's embedded so that no matter who is governor, this structure exists and can be funded. Certainly, certainly ditto to all of that. Uh, and I appreciate the question, Alana, because I, I want to address the deeper structural issue behind that question. Um, and we feel this acutely in Western Mass because, frankly, a lot of the most well-funded, highest endowed, largely white, largely male cultural organizations that have dominated the scene, so to speak, in Massachusetts are also 
almost entirely based in Boston. Uh, there's a few uh, exceptions, but we're here in Worcester, uh, which is in Central Mass, of course, does not have the same access uh, to those types of institutions uh, as, as, as there are in the city of Boston. And of course, obviously, communities within Boston don't have the same access to those institutions and those organizations. Just a little bit of context about the communities I represent. I represent some of the densest, uh, most urban communities in Massachusetts. I also have a town without a stoplight. And I appreciate you also mentioning uh, the lack of resources in rural communities, uh, which is a, a severe problem in Massachusetts. We have uh, urban communities, immigrant communities um, uh, um, uh, uh, that are locked out of access, systemically locked out of access to art support, arts education, arts funding. We also have rural communities uh, that have been uh, locked out as well. So just a couple of things on this. Uh, first, this is where public money does have to play a role because public money uh, has to be used for public purposes, which is helping catch up the organizations that have been left out and the communities that have been left out for generations. So we need to make sure that, for example, money spent by the Cultural Facilities Fund is spent in the highest need communities, which hasn't always been the case, by the way, with that program. And we've done audits and we've done oversight in the Economic Development Committee to look at that. Why would some of the wealthiest institutions be getting taxpayer-supported cultural facilities grants when you have small community theaters, you have local pop-up art installations, you have maker spaces in gateway cities that are getting nothing? That needs to be looked into, that needs to be investigated, and it really needs to stop. Mass Cultural Council grants and other uh, cash grants uh, that are granted shouldn't go to organizations that have massive endowments. They shouldn't go to organizations that have multi-million, in some cases, multi-billion dollar nest eggs to support their programming. It should go to the smaller, newer, more emergent community organizations uh, with less resources. You know, and the other thing I would, I would say is um, we need more visibility uh, into some of these organizations, how they oversee their funds. You know, many of these institutions are massively powerful. We don't have to name names. We all know who we're talking about. They're massively powerful. They have massive endowments, and they benefit from incredible tax subsidy. I mean, the, the, their endowments are not taxed. And so I think we need to make sure and look at, well, hey, they get that tax subsidy because they're supposed to be providing a public good. How much are they opening up their spaces to underserved communities? How much are they reinvesting or redistributing some of the money that they're generating from those endowments and from those savings into the highest need communities? How much proactive outreach are they doing to bring in and to support emerging communities? And very importantly, watch where the money is. Are their boards diverse? Are there, are there, trustee, uh, are there trusteeships diverse? And are they making an intentional effort and a proactive effort to change it, uh, because you know what's in the past is in the past. What we need to focus is on is how we change and improve for the future, and we've got to make sure that they're presenting that. Um, you also mentioned investment in workforce and workforce development programs. This is something I'm very passionate about. Uh, I chair our committee on economic development, where we oversee our workforce training programs, our voc ed programs. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning the work I've done with the adaptive music program. That's a partnership between UMass Amherst, the Community Music School in Springfield, and the Springfield Public School System. Again, it takes music teachers who are being trained at UMass and helps train them and support them in their um, special education work, and it takes special education teachers who are being trained at our local schools and universities and helps them learn uh, and be integrated into arts and music education. That's the kind of program we need to replicate uh, everywhere, and we need to make sure that we're supporting uh, um, career development in arts and culture because it requires a lot of expertise, it requires a lot of training, and it often doesn't pay very well uh, on, the, on the other end. So that's another area of, of really important growth for us as a state, something as Lieutenant Governor I'd really want to take on. Yeah, I too, uh, thank you for the question. So I think when I think about workforce development, I think, well, where does it really begin? And it really begins in our, in our schools and in our child care centers. And are there arts programs that are embedded within? Are they supported? 
And then are they supported all the way through the lifespan? So as I have already mentioned, I moved from the city of Lowell to the town of Acton. And when I made that shift, one of the things that I noticed that continues on for, you know, if people want to learn a new craft or learn a new a, a way to paint a certain way or cook certain foods, that they have access in the town of Acton to continuing education as adults. I don't see that in every single community across the Commonwealth. That's one way to tap into who might be somebody who is, has that talent and that drive and just hasn't had the time to lift their head up because they're just trying to get through their day. This morning I was uh, in Springfield and I met with folks at the Performance Project, uh, BIPOC-led, uh, first-generation focused um, program. And I asked the students, I asked the young people, what are the things that you wish that government leaders would do differently? And what they said was, invest in us. We don't need things that are for adults. The casino is not set up for us. We don't have places to go to be creative. We don't have places to go to hang out with our friends that are safe, that are places where we're not going to get in trouble. Those are the kinds of investment opportunities that I think of. And then when we kind of play that out, you know, we had a lot of conversations at the, at the state level when we rolled out um, legalization of cannabis. And we created a trust fund to make sure that there was equity and access to those funds. Because as Senator Lesser has pointed out, the, the folks who are on these larger institutions that do get the funding because they have the capacity, they also have the capacity to keep raising a lot of money because they are in the boardrooms with other folks who are their friends or you know those kinds of networks and connections that they have. So how do we create partnerships with BIPOC artists, with folks who are on the ground in smaller organizations in a way that they are also able to tap into the resources that exist. So creating technical assistance funds um, and technical assistance support, but also making sure that we are serious about investing in artists who are here. So as you're pointing out, they're not leaving. Um, we need to have the support, I think, for um, very diverse artists because we bring forth different cultural expression. Right? I went to the Puerto Rican parade over the weekend and I had so much fun listening to the music and the culture and the ways that everybody was celebrating Puerto Rican uh, culture and history. Those are the kinds of things that we need to keep bringing forward and investing in those kinds of programs. Thank you. With real money. Yes. Uh, so we are nearing the end of this portion of the program and I just wanna give a moment for each of you, if you have any closing thoughts, um, I invite you to share them. Uh, we can go down the line. And then I know we've got some exciting things that are happening right after this conversation. So I don't want to run over our time. But is there anything you would like to say as a closing thought? Well, thank you again for having us and for the performance. This has been a really wonderful way to spend uh, the evening. I am running to be a different type of lieutenant governor, really focused on putting people first, uh, investing in our communities, investing in our young people, and really tackling some of the big issues by getting at root causes. There are five working groups that I want to create that I think I've already mentioned around climate and housing, mental health, child care, and COVID. I want artists to be on those working groups to help us identify the root causes, but also to bring forth what are the issues that you're facing uh, in the arts and cultural sector, and also what are the ways that we can identify the issues that we need to tackle um, towards towards the future. So that's that's why I'm in this race, to be a different type of lieutenant governor. And I thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Well, thank you so much, Alana. Thank you to my uh, fellow candidates. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, and uh, again, just want to say my name's Eric Lesser, running for lieutenant governor, as are, of course, everyone on the stage right now. And uh, I just want you to know uh, that I will be a champion uh, and a partner uh, to our arts and culture community and an ally uh, to our community. Uh, I've, I've been there uh, for the last eight years in the state senate fighting to expand funding for the Mass Cultural Council, fighting to expand uh, the Cultural Facilities Fund program, making sure that we're auditing the program to make sure that it's going to people and organizations and communities that need it the most. 
Uh, just recently, when the ARPA funding came in, uh, the governor's proposal initially had that money going through MOT, Ma Mass Office of Travel and Tourism. A lot of you were involved in the advocacy for that. We helped lead the effort to rewrite that so it went through the Mass Cultural Council because the MCC knows the communities the best, knows the players the best, knows the organizations the best. As Lieutenant Governor, I want to put arts and culture at the center of everything we do, at the center of our response to the mental health crisis, at the center of the response to our housing. We actually didn't get to talk about housing, which is a, an acute issue for artists and people in the arts community who are getting priced out of increasingly gentrifying neighborhoods and communities as, as rents and housing prices skyrocket. I want the arts community to be part of our transportation solution as we work to expand rail service. We're here in Worcester, which has helped been transformed by its rail connectivity to Boston. We now need to pull that rail service west to Springfield and Pittsfield, and of course continue with South Coast Rail. And I wanna value and lift up the community because of what it is intrinsically, which is, was a topic that we all talked about today. We went through a lot. Everyone went through a lot through COVID, but no community was hurt or, or impacted quite like the arts and culture community was from COVID. The very nature of your sector is about community and collaboration and bringing people together. And COVID, of course, had to keep everyone apart. Not only was your community and the arts community the hardest hit by COVID, but I also think that your community, our community, the arts and culture community is going to be the key to healing after COVID uh, because it's arts, it's culture, it's performance that helps bring people together, helps heal, helps rebuild and restitch community after a trauma uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that, that was experienced over the last two now, almost three years. So I just really wanna thank everybody for the invitation, uh, for having us here today. And I'm really excited to get to work and to continue our partnership and our work together. Thank you. All right, I'm bad in cleanup, right? So um, I just wanna say thank you so much, one, for having all of us here, giving us a chance to introduce ourselves to you, a little bit more about why we're excited about this race. And in particular for carving out time to talk about a topic that I think doesn't get talked about enough as often. I'm really grateful that you're organizing around uh, getting to the ballot box to really support candidates that will invest in spaces and places that are not only gonna help art and culture, but frankly help the Commonwealth. I think we're heading into some choppy waters as I think about what's ahead economically. I'm an optimist always, but I feel like with interest rates and inflation, a lot of uncertainty uh, as we move forward, and also historic opportunities. You know, as mayor, you know, the buck stops with me. I do respect to my colleagues. Um, we've had, you know, an opportunity here to spend the time talking about art and culture and why those investments haven't been made already. You know, we just passed sports betting. We've had uh, cannabis. We've had all these new revenues coming into our Commonwealth. And every year it feels like the art and culture community has to fight for crumbs. And we rally to say, oh, it's going to get cut. And then it gets put back in. I'd love to be in a place, in a position where we're not doing that, where we're actually treating art and culture in a respectful industry, the way we think about life sciences or advanced manufacturing or other meaningful places that have jobs, that add quality of life, that are important to our communities. That's what I've done as mayor. I, I think this race is about who's gonna be a really strong partner for our next governor. You can tell we're all certainly supportive of art and culture, but who's actually gonna embed the structure, the funding, in state government in a way that's gonna allow us to make good on these promises and these ideas. I think I've done that at the local level. I firmly believe that what happens in our communities, the success of our Commonwealth is based on working cities, cities that are thriving. And how are our communities thriving? Frankly, through a lot of art and culture. So I wanna thank you for having, for having me here, for giving me a chance to share a little bit more about my campaign. I'd be thrilled to have your support in this race. I'm excited to roll up my sleeves and get to work and take this experience from the Get Stuff Done branch of government <laughs> to the State House and partner with our next governor and make sure we're putting art and culture in the center of all that we do moving forward. Thanks. Thank you so much to our three candidates. <laughs> much appreciated. Now I believe something exciting is going to happen, so I'm going to turn this over to whoever gets this microphone next, which might be you. Do we get to sing? No. <laughs> Did you want to sing? <laughs> um, thank you so much, folks. Uh, we're going to ask you to sort of 
get up and get back to your seats. Uh, folks, don't leave just yet. Uh, we have uh, an amazing dance performance by Anna and Mori that we're going to uh, share with you. And then after that, um, we ask that you stick around for the next 20 or so minutes and chat with us and whoever you know wants to hang out and really talk about art in Massachusetts. So uh, I thought that would take longer. <laughs> I'm helping. All right, folks, enjoy. Do you not see us dancing? Pack fuzzy shoes, a fun coat, your favorite sweater. Write yourself a love letter. Tape it to the wall beside your mirror. Honor yourself. You don't need permission. What is it we tell ourselves? Be you. Do you love you? And what is it they tell of us? The parts we hide to make others more comfortable. As if it were up to them to tell us we belong. To tell us who we are, what we can and can't do, how we can and can't be, who we can and can't dance with. Pero no nos ves bailando. Can't you see? How etiquette in dance intersects with mindfulness in life. How dance has a way of teaching you biases you never knew you had. What is it about two women dancing that made you think you could dub yourself our knight in shining armor and rescue us from dancing together? No, you cannot cut in today. You cannot cut in, I say. Do you not see us dancing? What world did you think you were in? Here, we hold hands in public. Love who we love. Color outside the lines. Wear our stories front and center. Find happiness at the end of a downward smile. Find happy. Here, I don't need permission to write myself a love letter, tape it to the wall beside my mirror, honor myself, wear my favorite coat, a fun sweater, and pack fuzzy shoes for this life-long journey. Elise gaily enters, eager for tonight's festivities. He skips side to side, rides sway with the music as she skips, sways, skips, sways, skips, sways.
right arm rises, arcs overhead. She pushes out to a lunge facing right. She faces front, looking down, rising up, toes tapping, spinning, right hand crutch drops as the right hand reacts to the music. is just a pretty dance instead of everything it takes to make the dance. Every part of my inner being no one sees me Pushing against these stressors. The stress of making this artistic work, the unpaid administrative hours behind making the work exist. All anyone sees is the pretty pump. Just a mask. No one sees the person behind heading the dance. Rolling and pushing, rolling and pushing. these stressors. I grab my crutches and slowly rise and run, catching my breath. A candidate mentioned about disabled people not being in the room. We're in the room. We're in here. Even if you don't know it, even if it can't be a visible disability, even if it is visible and I'm sitting in the front row, we're here. 
we're in the room. <laughs> Make us a part of these decisions. Make us a part of this. Stop working for our community and work with our community. <laughs> and recognize our presence. My name is Elise Patterson. I'm the founder of Ability Stands. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. So sorry about that. I got a little excited and lost my place in the evening. Um, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so we're just about wrapped up. We, the Mass Creative folks, are going to remain here in the building till about 9:30. So we ask that uh, instead of going directly home, come out, hang out, speak to each other, speak with us. Uh, you know, continue sort of building that amazing creative community. Um, I want to thank um, Worcester Interfaith and uh, Mass Voter Table, who you may have seen up front. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kim Jones. Uh, she owns Strong Style Coffee in Fitchburg, Mass. Uh, she's the one that catered tonight's event. So all that delicious like food that you ate, that was all her. So thank you so much. And I want to thank the visual artists that uh, were gracious enough to uh, allow us to showcase some of their work outside. Uh, John Powers, who I believe is in here somewhere. Um, Julie Checo, who couldn't be here today. Um, Ashley Lafita, uh, who also couldn't be here today, and uh, myself. So thank you all so much. And uh, if you take nothing else away from tonight, uh, please take away how important it is to vote and that your vote matters and it counts and it affects us all. So thank you so much. Thank you.